Now, please take your Bibles out and turn with me to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. And I know I say this all the time. And by the way, I'm so glad you're all here this morning. And for those who are joining us online, I'm so glad that you're joining us on, online. We're looking at Psalm 78 today. And I know it sounds crazy. Each time I, I introduce another song, oh, this one's really good. Oh, you think the other one's great. Oh, this is. But Psalm 78 really is the most unique of all the songs that we've been looking at so far. I'll explain why in just a few minutes after we read the passage, but I'll give you a heads up that one of the reasons it's unique from every other song, usually if you were to add up all the songs and divide them by how many, what's the average length of a song, the psalms are usually averaging around 20 verses. But Psalm 78 breaks that mold. It's 72 verses. It's the longest song that we're looking at so far. And I was trying to think of how do we do this in a practical way? Do I read half this week and next week? And no, I think you'd lose the context and the impact if we tried to just split it up into two weeks. We'll take two weeks to cover our study of Psalm 78, but this morning I'm just going to read the whole thing to you. And you can follow along in your Bibles, but we normally have the NIV, the New International Version on the screen, for those who have NIV Bibles. But a song this long, I thought, it would be so much, it, the flow of it is just a little bit smoother for public reading from the New Living Translation, the NLT. And so it's not that much different from what you might have in the NIV, but if you want to follow along with me on the screen, I'm going to read Psalm 78 as it's translated in the NLT, all right? So starting with verse 1, Asaph writes, O oh, my people, Listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I'm saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Stories that we have heard and known. Stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. About his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. God commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they, in turn, will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. The warriors of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned their backs and fled on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his instructions. They forgot what he had done, the great wonders he had shown them, the miracles he did for their ancestors on the plain of Zoan in the land of Egypt. For he divided the sea and led them through, making the water stand up like walls. In the daytime, he led them by a cloud. And all night long, he led them by a pillar of fire. He split open the rocks in the wilderness to give them water as from a gushing spring. He made streams pour from the rock, making the waters flow like a river. And yet they kept on sinning against him rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They stubbornly tested God in their hearts, demanding the foods they craved. They even spoke against God himself, saying, God can't give us food in the wilderness. Oh, yes, he can strike a rock so water gushes out, but he can't give his people bread and meat. When the Lord heard them, he was furious. The fire of his wrath burned against Jacob. And yet his anger rose against Israel, for they did not believe God or trust, to, trust him to care for them. But he commanded the skies to open. He opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna for them to eat. He gave them bread from heaven. They ate the food of angels. 
and God gave them all they could hold. He released the east wind in the heavens and guided the south wind by his mighty power. He rained down meat as thick as dust, birds as plentiful as the sand on the seashore. He caused the birds to fall within their camp and all around their tents. And the people ate their fill. God gave them what they craved. But before they satisfied their craving, while the, while the meat was still in their mouths, the anger of God rose up against them and he killed, them with their, he killed their strongest men. He struck down the finest of Israel's young men. But in spite of this, the people kept sinning. Despite his wonders, they refused to trust him. So he ended their lives in failure, their years in terror. When God began killing them, they finally sought him. They repented and took God seriously. Then they remembered that God was the rock, that God Most High was their redeemer. But all they gave to him was lip service. They lied to him with their tongues. Their hearts did, were not loyal to him. They did not keep his covenant. And yet God was merciful and forgave their sins and did not destroy them all. Many times he held back his anger and did not unleash his fury. For he remembered that they were merely mortal, gone like, like a breath of wind that never returns. Oh, how they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved his heart in that dry wasteland. Again and again, they tested God's patience and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power and how he rescued them from their enemies. They did not remember his miraculous signs in Egypt, his wonders on the plain of Zoan. For he turned their rivers into blood so no one could drink from the streams. He sent vast swarms of flies to consume them and hordes of frogs to ruin them. He gave their crops to caterpillars. Their harvest was consumed by locusts. He destroyed their grapevines with hail and shattered their sycamore figs with sleet. He abandoned their cattle to the hail, their livestock to bolts of lightning. He loosed on them his fierce anger, all of his fury, rage, and hostility. He dispatched against them a band of destroying angels. He turned his anger against them. He did not spare the Egyptian lives, but ravaged them with the plague. He killed the oldest, of each, he killed the oldest son in each Egyptian family, the flower of youth throughout the land of Egypt. But he led his own people like a flock of sheep, guiding them safely through the wilderness. He kept them safe so that they were not afraid but the sea covered their enemies. God brought them to the border of his holy land, to this land of hills he had won for them. He drove out the nations before them. He gave them their inheritance by lot. God settled the tribes of Israel into their homes. But they kept testing and rebelling against God most high. They did not obey his laws. They turned back and were faithless, as faithless as their parents. They were as undependable as a crooked bull. They angered God by building shrines to other gods. They made him jealous with their idols. When God heard them, he was very angry and he completely rejected Israel. Then he abandoned his dwelling at Shiloh, the tabernacle where he had lived among the people. He allowed the ark of his might to be captured. He surrendered his glory into enemy hands. God gave his people over to be butchered by the sword because he was so angry with his own people, his special possession. Their young men were killed by the fire. Their young women died before singing their wedding songs. Their priests were slaughtered and their widows could not mourn their deaths. Then the Lord rose up as though waking from a sleep, like, like a warrior aroused from a drunken stupor. He routed his enemies and sent them to eternal shame. 
But God rejected Joseph's descendants. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. He, st- he chose instead the tribe of Judah and Mount Zion, which he loved. There he built his sanctuary, as high as the heavens, as solid and enduring as the earth itself. He chose his servant David, calling him from the sheep pens. He took David from tending the ewes and the lambs and made him the shepherd of Jacob's descendants, God's own people, Israel. He, David, cared for them with a true heart and led them with skillful hands. What I love about the last sentence in verse 72, he cared for them with a true heart. In direct context, it's referring to David. In the larger context, it's God himself. God, in spite of everything that the Israelites had done to turn against him, God faithfully and lovingly cared for them with a true heart and led them with skillful hands. This is such an amazing song. When we're looking at this, and I was thinking, how are we going to work through this song together? We're going to split it up into two parts. And today, we're just looking at the introduction. The introduction itself will take our full period. Next week, we'll come back and we'll start looking at some of the principles within the rest of the song. But let me make three observations about Psalm 78 that make this such an important and significant psalm as we do with each of these songs that we're looking at. The first observation, as we've seen in so many of these songs over the last month or so, this song was written by Asaph. Now, again, there are literally generations of people who go by the name of Asap. The original Asap was appointed by David to be a worship leader in the temple when it would be built by Solomon. Asaph then had children and his sons who followed him in this position for literally hundreds of years also were worship leaders and wrote songs, but rather than using their name, they just wrote, all their songs and identified them as songs of Asaph. So sometimes it's a little bit of a challenge to figure out when you read that this song was written by Asaph, which one it was actually written about, and you only have the context typically to give you an idea. Now when we look at Psalm 78, within the context, although there is nothing in the title that tells us when it was written, the internal evidence and the things that are being described as the circumstances for writing this song point to the fact that this song was most likely written by the original Asaph that was appointed by David as the worship leader. Everything in the song is a history of Israel, and it stops with David. It's a celebration of God's grace and mercy, his shepherding care through David. And it's this point of honor to end the song with who would have been the most recent king. And so without any hesitation, I am convinced that the original Asaph, and this would be the second song that we've seen written by this particular man named Asaph. Now, the second observation is something that I shared with you last week, and that is that you have companion songs, songs that share the same overall theme. And this is one of those companion songs between Psalm 77, 78, 79, and 80 that all share the common theme that regardless of the good times or the difficult times that we go through, the only reason that we survive, the only reason that we are able to thrive is because of the greatness of God's power and shepherding care in our lives. Last time we looked at that, I shared with you the verses from each of these songs that highlight the fact that God is a faithful shepherd to his people. We won't do that again this morning, but you can know that it shares the same theme as we saw at the end of the song as we read it today. But more than anything else about this song, the thing that makes us it makes it the most unique is that this technically really isn't a song. The songs that have about 20 verses to them are songs that could easily be sung as part of the temple worship. 
so many of them even have a particular tune that's identified that they would sing those songs. But Psalm 78 really isn't as much a song as it is a poetic history lesson. Asaph is writing about the history of Israel with a single point that God is making through him. There is one driving purpose for Psalm 78. And that theme that God is using Asaph to communicate is that God calls believing parents of every generation to share their faith with their children and their grandchildren so that every generation can know and experience the blessings of being in relationship with him. Last night I shared this and somebody said, Steve, that is one of the longest propositional statements I have ever read. I said, well, when you have a psalm with 72 verses, it deserves a good long prop statement. But this is why, David, why Asaph wrote the psalm. This is the single dominating purpose for Psalm 78. God calls believing parents of every generation in both the Old Covenant, the old relationship he had with them in the Old Testament, and in the New Covenant relationship that he has with the church. God calls every generation of believing parents to share their faith with their children and their grandchildren so that every generation can know God and be in relationship with him. Wow. Okay. Where we're going from this point on is going to be a little uncomfortable, okay? But I want to speak the truth in love this morning and just share with you that the modern church, even the evangelical church of today in the Western culture is not in a good place. Study after study shows that the modern church today, even in evangelicalism, the church is in an unhealthy place. Do you know that as you look at the landscape of Christianity and churches in America, 85% of all churches are losing members, losing people. Only 15% of all churches are growing today. And you might say, well, that sounds pretty good at least for 15%. But when you look at that number, 15% of American churches are growing today, but 85% of that 15% of growing churches are only growing because people are transferring and moving from one church to the other. Only 15% of 15% of all churches are growing because people are getting saved and coming into a new relationship with Christ. There's something wrong there. To make this even more impacting, most of the people who are leaving churches today, evangelical churches included, are young people who are now college age, and once they get out of high school, go to college, they never come back. Too many studies have been done that demonstrate the fact that as soon as kids leave home, they leave the church. There are a handful that stay faithful, who end up going and finding, it, finding a great church, but most today are not. And you have to wonder why. What's wrong with the church today? Why is the church so unhealthy today that we're losing most of our kids? And as you study this out, you find that there are four dominant reasons why the church is losing members and young people are not coming back and it comes down to one issue and that is that parents aren't sharing their faith and handing their faith down to the next generation. One of the reasons, the key reason is that parents say, well, there's just not enough time today. What they're really saying is, I have other priorities in my life. I have other priorities. A dad says, you know, I work all week long. Sunday is my only day to re re relax and rest and have some fun. I don't want to spend half of the day in church, and so it's just, you know, maybe some other time will be more convenient. 
or in our culture today. Nothing has impacted family life in the church on weekends more than traveling sports and summer sports. We used to know, in my, when I was younger, everybody knew that when the first of June came, school is out, you're going to have lots of families on vacation, but the first of September, by Labor Day, everybody's coming back, and that's when the ministry year would start again in a big way. But you'd have probably two to three months of you know, low attendance during the summer. That's not the case anymore. Because of weekend baseball and other things that are going on for families where Saturdays used to be for those things, now everything is on Sunday. And churches have come to understand that the summer loss isn't just June, July, and August. Now it starts with May 1st, and it goes all the way to October 1st. There are families that we will not see for nearly five months just because their kids are busy with team sports. I have a close friend, a wonderful guy, great worker, hard worker, great friend, great husband, great dad. But he wants his six-year-old to play baseball. And every week, baseball is what he's got his boy in, and they're gone, gone, gone. Finally, I just had a straight talk with him. And I said to him, I won't say his name, but I said, point blank, do you want your son to know more about baseball or God? Without any hesitation, he shot back immediately, God, of course. I said, how's that going to happen? When you never take your kid to church, you never teach him the Bible, all you've shown him is that church is an option. Just another option of good things that we can choose. Parents regular, oh, we're just so busy, so busy, so busy on the weekends. A second reason that parents don't share their faith in a meaningful way is they say, well, my kids aren't interested. They've got so many other things that they're pursuing. And I'm thinking... Are you kidding me? Who's, who's in charge of this family? All right, can I be honest? Who's the adult? I don't care if my kids aren't interested. They aren't interested in vegetables either. It's that simple. But I'm the parent. I'm the one who's God's given the responsibility to make sure that my kids grow up healthy, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. It's not their choice. Good grief. If I, if I got paid at the end of the week and I sat down with my kids and said, hey, I've got some money here. Should we pay bills or go buy ice cream? What do you think they're going to choose? And yet this is exactly how we approach the spiritual life of our family at times. Well, I don't want to force my kids to, into my belief structure. I want to give them the option. This idea is absolutely crazy to me. It's, it's rooted in the idea that our children are just in a moral vacuum, that there's nothing that's going to impact them till they're about 18 years old, and then they can decide for themselves. Are you kidding? That is absolutely crazy to think that our kids aren't picking up moral values as they're growing up. Or that they're going to be morally and spiritually neutral until they get through with college. Folks, understand, from the very first time our kids can start understanding what's happening in life, they are now learning values, moral and spiritual values from us. In fact, it wasn't Karl Marx, it wasn't John Dewey, the father of modern education, it was Aristotle, 2,000 years ago, who first said, you give me a child until he's seven, and I'll show you the man. This is why the cultural battle isn't happening in high schools anymore. It's all about the grade school. This is exactly why drag queens are now reading stories to preschool and early grade school kids in libraries. This is why Planned Parenthood has designed an entire sexual orientation curriculum 
It's not intended for high school kids. It's all geared towards middle school, grade six, grade seven, and grade eight. This is why the 1619 Project, one of the most disruptive and historically inaccurate philosophical approaches to American history, has been presented not simply for the high school level, but also the seeds of it are being taught in the grade schools. Because everybody in the culture understands if you can get children as they're shaping their values, everything will be normalized for them. And we're going to be able to have a culture that is so secular and corrupted, morally corrupted, but it won't matter because this is what they're used to. And when parents say, you know, I don't want to force my beliefs on my kids. I'm going to let them grow up and decide which way they want to go. What we're really communicating to our kids at that point is saying that we see our Christianity as nothing more than a culture instead of an eternal reality. It is just another option. And friends, let me just be absolutely clear, especially for your parents who have young kids. The moment you communicate to your kids that Christianity is just a cultural option and they can choose their own culture options as they're getting older and grow up, they've already come to the understanding that Christianity isn't real. It's just what you were used to. And because you're used to it, you want to live that way, but because I'm going to be used to a different culture, I can choose that instead. That's a dangerous place to be. And then the last reason that Christian parents fail to teach children their spiritual values and truth is because we get tired of the battle. It doesn't seem to do any good. I'm so tired of always telling my kids, you need to be there, you need to do this, you need to do, you need, this is what you believe. It feels like at times that we are walking uphill against the wind and you get tired and just say, ah, it, there's no point of it. But friends, let me make this absolutely clear. The spiritual reality is this, and I can't put it any plainer. If Christian parents don't teach their children what they should believe, the culture around us is going to tell them what they should not believe. Let that sink in, will you? As parents and even grandparents, if we're not teaching our kids what is true and right, what they should believe, the culture around us, the secularized, fallen, depraved culture of darkness is going to tell them, oh, you don't have to listen to your folks. You don't have to read the Bible. All that religion stuff is just nonsense. And what we're seeing in the church today is what's sometimes described as the three generational chairs of faith. Three generational chairs of faith represent, each chair represents a place in our understanding of Christianity. The first chair is the first gen understanding of Christianity where somebody gets saved and they're so excited, they read their Bible, they're passionate about God, they want to serve. It's like somebody who is an entrepreneur who starts his own business and he's passionate about that. Oh, this is amazing and wonderful. And they are committed to growing and following Christ and serving him. But the second gen chair are the children who grow up in Christian homes. And they hear all the stories. They understand all the lingo. They know how to talk. They know how to be religious. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they are in relationship with God. They are religious they know how to stay out of trouble. And let's be honest, we all know kids who grew up in Christian schools. For 12 years of school, they were there. They said all the right things. They knew how to live, to look good, and then they were gone. What happened to them? Some of these people in the second gen chair are people who have heard the truth all of their life, but simply haven't decided if they're going to make their own values and commitment to become a first-gen, first-chair believer. And 
you have to do this. All of us who grew up in Christian homes grew up in the second gen chair. And we had to decide. We had to personalize the faith and say, you know what? I'm not content just to be a second gen. I'm going to live as a first gen follower of Jesus. You have to do that. Because if you don't, if you stay in the second gen mindset, what happens is that the third gen chair comes along and your children, they're not going to have any of it. Because what values you got, what principles you got, what morals you might have gotten as a second gen, you're not pursuing. It doesn't become real. It only seems to your kids like this is just your choice, your option for living. And the third gen person says, yeah, I, they didn't grow up in church because you may not have gone as a second gen person. They may not share the same morals or values or integrity and ethics because now they're going to find their own path. And every one of us who grew up as a second-gen chair person have to decide we're going to become first-gen believers in our passion for Christ so that the third-gen will know that it's real and they can move towards that chair as well. Does that make sense? Okay, good, go ahead. Because I'm telling you, this gets a little bit challenging at times, especially when you move from the American culture to other world countries and cultures there. I mean, here it's pretty basic. We understand how our culture works here. What I find is really interesting is when you step out of American culture into other cultures, especially in Africa where there are more tribal cultures that people grew up in. Now, let me just share an interesting dilemma I've had uh, for years now, I've had the opportunity to mentor other pastors in other countries. I have a pastor in India I work with on a regular basis, have been for five years. Just this, uh, probably about three months ago, a pastor in Uganda sent me a text and said, I've been watching your church services, and he started with the core question series, and he says, I am sharing your messages with my church and with a group of a dozen other pastors, and we would like you to mentor us as pastors for our churches. I said, this is really cool. I'll be glad to do that. And so on Thursdays, twice a month, I'm going to be meeting, you know, like Zoom type of meetings with a dozen pastors in Uganda, and I'm already communicating with them. Now, what was really kind of a challenge was on, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, on June 24th, the text I got from, and the fellow's name is Ofono Rec. That's the pastor's name that, I, that first reached out to me. Ofono Rec wrote me, and he said, here's the group, here's what we're doing. And he said, I got a question for you. Good evening, Pastor Steve. Today, I have a question. Could you elaborate for me the meaning of Jesus, the Lamb of God, in its deep spiritual knowledge? And I read that, whoa, yeah, I love that kind of deep theological, whoa, we're going to go places with that. And I was all set. A minute later, a second text, a minute later, a second text came and says, another question I met today. One person got saved. He has four wives, and totally wants to be saved, what do I tell him? <laughs> I'm serious. He's, he's asking, does he get rid of three wives in order to be a Christian? It is a tough one. All right, so you guys, what would you tell him? Pick your favorite one. Yeah, pick yeah, the first one. Uh, okay, you want to know what I told him? Come back next week. No, uh, I, this, is tr this is the truth. I wrote him back and I said, we'll tackle the Lamb of God issue later. Let me just tell you, tell the man, don't get rid of his four wives or three of them because it's not fair. They're coming from a completely different cultural background. And what's more important right now is that they're saved and trusting God. It would be unfair to simply say to three of the wives, 
well, sorry, you're on your own, and throw them out to the wolves. But just as quickly, I said, but your responsibility is to understand that this was not God's original plan for families and marriage, and you are to encourage your wives to live godly in Christ Jesus, but you are to teach your children God's plan for a family life and how they should live so that the second generation is able to learn spiritual truth and be passionate about God and then they don't have to deal with the baggage of being a first gen in that kind of culture. Okay, you can let me know if I'm a heretic later, all right? But listen, folks, the point I want to challenge you with is that whether it's in Uganda or America, in our own families, Christians must show their children that our faith is not merely an option in life. Christian parents must show that their, their children that my faith is not merely another option, another choice. It is my life. It is my life. Look, I love my house. God's given me a wonderful, beautiful house. I love my cars. I love all the junk and toys, and it's so fun. But if you took right, if the house burned down, if the cars broke down, if I lost all the toys, that's all right. I'm going to survive. But you take away my faith. You take away my relationship with God, and my life is done. Christianity and my relationship with God is not just an option. And the moment you teach your kids by your personal choices that Christianity is just an option, then that's all it's ever going to be for them. Oh, wow. Anybody need to get a cup of coffee at this point? All right. So why do we teach our faith to our kids? Why do we lead our children? There are three reasons that this is so absolutely critical. And the first one, point blank, is God commands it. God commands this. You go all the way back to the earliest writings of the Old Testament, and God says, believing parents, parents who believe in the covenant promises of God, the redemptive promises of God, the believing parent and grandparent who has a relationship with God has an absolute responsibility. It is not an option. We have the responsibility to bring our children up to know God. Man, Deuteronomy. And you find this over and over in the book of Deuteronomy as Moses is communicating not just the moral law and the religious, the ceremonial law and all that, but he's saying this is the heart of God for his people. You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands. That's our responsibility as parents. Repeat them again and again and again and again to your children. Talk about God when you're at home. Talk about God when you're on the road. Talk about God when you're going to bed. Talk about God when you're getting up. Tie on your hands God's commands. Wear them on your forehead. Now, the literalists and the legalists said, oh, that means we're supposed to, in, in Jesus' day, they wore what was called phylacteries, little, little boxes that they strapped to their forehead with scriptures in it. Oh, see, we're, we're obeying. We're putting it on our foreheads, and they wear leather bands with scripture engraved in it. Oh, we're tying them to our hands. That's not what he's referring to here. He's saying, listen, Spiritual truth should be so much a part of your life that it's, it's who you are. It's who you are. And this responsibility isn't just given to parents. It's just as incumbent upon grandparents as well. Again, when we, get, when we move from Deuteronomy 6, I want you to see what God had already said through Moses in Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. Watch out! Be careful never to forget your, what you yourself have seen. Don't let these memories escape from your mind as long as you live. Be sure to pass them along to your children and your grandchildren. All right, so I have, 
a picture of my buddy Carl Bunder here. And I got to tell you this story because this is one of the most powerful, impacting moments of my entire 40 years of ministry. It's been so cool for me to see new people coming to the Lord as they've come and become first-gen chair believers at Village Church over the last couple of years. It's just been amazing. And then we see the families expanding and parents and children coming and worshiping together. That's so cool. But what's really been the phenomena that's been amazing to me is seeing that so many of our families are going beyond just first- and second-gen chair believers and relationships here, but we're still starting to see three and four generation families attending. Grandparents with their children and their grandchildren. And to my knowledge, if you, if you know somebody then I'm missing them, right now we only have one four generation family clan here. And that's the Boonder Eric's clan. And Carl and Annette Boonder are here. Cindy Eriks is their daughter. Rich and Sue Eriks are here. Rick Eriks is their son. And then Rick and Cindy have two of their children here. And it's been so cool to see Troy and Janice and then Kayla and Nathan, and they're both here. And now with Janice's son, Ezra, four generations are all serving the Lord together and worshiping here. And wow. This is so cool Amen. that parents and grandparents can impact children and grandchildren. And you might think, oh, that's just Old Testament stuff. No, it's just as incumbent on the church today. When Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, specializing, focusing on fathers, fathers, bring your children up with the discipline and the instruction that comes from the Lord. This is our job. This is our responsibility. And look, you may be the most successful guy in your office. You may be the most successful guy with a portfolio and a house and all the cars and all the toys. But in the end, there's nobody on his deathbed who says, boy, I wish I had spent just a little more time in the office. In the end, nobody on his deathbed says, man, I, I wish I had just bought that last car. All that's going to matter is what you leave behind with your kids and your grandkids, a spiritual heritage. That is so much more important than a, in, in a financial inheritance. So God commands us to do this. And let me reinforce this point again, the second reason why we have to do this, and we've already touched on it. If we don't spiritually shape our children, the world will. You can count on it. If we don't shape our kids, the world is going to step into that slot and already wants to. And if we forget that Christianity is our life, not just a cultural option, then we need to come back to our understanding that our kids and grandkids' eternal destiny depends on our telling them about the Lord. Beyond yeah, all of that, Psalm 78 celebrates, and the fourth reason that we share our faith intentionally with our kids is that a spiritual heritage, a family spiritual heritage, honors God. When God looks at families that are serving Him and loving Him together, God just, oh, that is so cool. That is so amazing. I love that. And that's where Psalm 78 takes us. It is a celebration of the family heritage of faith that God wants to see in our lives, in our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. Asaph writes, Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I'm saying, for I'm going to speak to you a parable. I'm going to give you a lesson with a point. I'm going to teach you heaven lessons from our past, stories that we've all heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. 
We will not hide these truths from our children. And we will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. This delights God when we share his glory with our kids and grandkids. This is why we're here. This is why we have families. For God issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children. So that, why did God do all this? So that the next generation might know. Even the children who are not yet born. And when they hear it from their parents, they're going to teach their own children. So that each generation can put its hope in the Lord. The Lord. The Lord. Wow, I want to challenge you. If you're here, there are three groups of people here this morning. Those who are parents, whether your children are still at home or not. If you're a parent, I want to encourage and challenge you to to decide that you're going to share your faith with your kids in a dynamic and intentional way. Even if they're already gone, you can say, hey, You know, this is something that God has just impressed on my heart. I want to make sure you understand that Christianity is not just a cultural option. It is my life. Then we have people who are grandparents here. Grandparents are great grandparents. Boy, don't underestimate the role that you play in shaping the values and the life of your grandchildren. They look to you. They look to you as well. Then we have people here who are not parents or grandparents. You've never had children. You say, well, then how does this sermon even come close to applying to my life? And what is so cool here at Village Church and in other churches is the role that volunteers play who may not be parents, maybe they've never had kids before, but they live as surrogate parents and grandparents through the children's ministry at the church. We had 80 people assisting as volunteers in our VBS program. Every one of them were fulfilling this requirement that God gives us to be able to teach these values to children. For the people who are involved in the powerhouse program, for the people who are even involved in the toddler program, for those who are involved in the Awana program, for those who are helping out in all the different children's ministries and even the high school, junior high, high school ministry, you are stepping into a role that is absolutely critical in the lives of other kids. When we were living in Aurora, my parents lived in Zion, Illinois, and Krista's parents lived in Milwaukee. We really didn't have grandparents that were local. And there was a couple in their 70s who lived right down three doors from us, Mr. and Mrs. Hughes. And every single day, our boys would get home from school and they would go over to Mrs. Hughes and they'd play checkers and get donuts, which they knew they weren't supposed to have. But they, she would spoil them, but they were godly Christians who were instilling values and sharing with our kids. When we moved here, they would drive from Aurora to be at Grandparents' Day at the Lansing Christian School where the boys were in school. It was a wonderful relationship that changed our boys' lives. You can have that kind of relationship even if you don't have kids. And I want to encourage you and challenge you to pray about how you can make a difference in kids' lives as we lead them to the Lord, all right? We're going to stop there. We're out of time. Next week, we're going to come back and dig into this even more and see some of the other principles that God has for us in Psalm 78, all right? So as the team comes up, let's pray. Father, thank